Everybody hear me in the back? Okay. Um, and we are really happy to be able to present this sand mine panel today for the benefit of this community so that we can learn about what's going on with sand mining. The recent influx of sand mines and processing plants in western Wisconsin has left many residents with questions and concerns that we want to address this evening. We are delighted to have six distinguished and experienced panel members who will address various aspects of the sand mining process. At the end of this evening, we hope you will have a good understanding of why the mines are here, the possible effects on our area, including job opportunities, as well as water and air issues and strategies for addressing concerns in our community. The format for the evening will be as follows. Each speaker will have about 15 minutes to share information in his area of expertise. Following the presentations, we will accept both written and oral questions. And there will be people in the aisles that will be able to collect those questions from you. Um, or if you prefer to do an oral question, we will also have a microphone that we'll bring out to the audience so everyone can hear the questions. Questions may be addressed to one or all of the panel members. Please remember that our panel members are here to give information and address concerns. We ask all members of the audience to be respectful and state questions in a concise and non-judgmental way. We would ask you to refrain from statements of opinion because we only have time to address questions. We will do questions till at least nine o'clock and if there's a lot more left, we probably will continue a little bit longer. Each of our guests this evening has an extensive and impressive resume. However, for the sake of time and with their permission, I will be brief in their introductions. We will begin the presentations now with our first speaker, Rich Buttinger. He is the Regional Manager of Wisconsin Industrial Sand with locations in Maiden Rock, Menominee, and Hager City. We are happy to have him here to talk about why the sand mine boom in western Wisconsin and how sand mines may benefit our communities. Rich? Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Linda, for your efforts and your team's efforts for putting this together. It's a great opportunity to talk about such a, a great topic and a hot topic within Wisconsin uh, and Minnesota. There's, uh, it's not just Wisconsin, but primarily in, in uh, Wisconsin, uh, it seems like the last four or five years, and especially the last year. Uh, like Linda said, I'm, I'm the regional manager, regional operations manager for Wisconsin Industrial Sand. Um, I joined the company uh, back in 2007, and I was responsible for the development of the mine and uh, the processing facility here at Minami. What I'm going to talk about, um, geology and fracturing sand, why the geology uh, has the qualities, uh, what are the qualities of fracturing sand, uh, natural resources, uh, and then a little bit of, a little overview about, about the uh, company I work for, uh, Fairmont Minerals, Wisconsin Industrial Sand. And then what Linda asked me to uh, discuss, to highlight, would be the economic and social benefits of mining operations. First, this is a surface bedrock geology map of the state of Wisconsin. Essentially, the sand is at the surface, the surface bedrock, wherever you see uh, tan on this map. Uh, it's also underneath the blue to the west along the Mississippi River. So the blue is actually a uh, limestone, and that's where you see the bluffs along the river. Underneath the limestone is uh, sand as well. Essentially, the erosional feature that created, created the uh, sand deposits came from uh, the northern, northeastern part of the state and eroded down towards uh, the Mississippi River. This is a uh, stratigraphic column. It's a little fuzzy and, and bring a pointer with me, but you'll see the bottom geology is actually the uh, Precambrian aged granite. Right above the granite, uh, there's a formation called the Mount Simon that is a frac sand grade 
uh, geology formation. Uh, above that is the Eau Claire. Uh, it is not a frac sand grade uh, deposit. And then there's the Wanawak. The Wanawak is the uh, dominant sandstone that you see in this area within the ridges. Then above that, uh, you get into a Jordan sandstone. The Jordan sandstone is directly underlying the dolomite, the dolomite that you will see in the bluffs on both sides of the Mississippi River, uh, and also uh, inland uh, in the Arcata area where the high ridges are, uh, and over into Mondovi. Above the Jordan um, and the Oneota is another uh, frac sand grade deposit called the St. Peter sandstone. All four of these sandstone uh, formations are currently being mined within Wisconsin. To give you an idea, this is the uh, Wanawak. This is the um, uh, picture during the mine development at uh, Menominee. And you can kind of see it is, a, it is a bedded deposit. It does have uh, several different layers varying in, in quality from fine sand to coarse sand. You see the red staining is, is more of an iron oxide uh, staining. So as we evaluate geology and look at the quality of a reserve, uh, we evaluate these characteristics within uh, the sandstone body itself. This is the uh, ridge uh, from a distance uh, and the development of the mine in Menominee. So jumping out to uh, fracturing sand, what makes uh, the geology in Wisconsin, the four uh, formations, uh, quality uh, fracturing <coughs> sands for the, for the market? Uh, essentially, it's uh, round quartz grains, uh, varying uh, sizes, and it's a uh, strength uh, characteristic also uh, that makes the uh, sand meet the market uh, demands for the fracturing sand market. Uh, so it's round, strong, and then the, the uh, grain sizes uh, within the sandstone. This is a picture under a um, microscope. You can see they're not they're not perfectly round spheres, but you can see the pore spacing in between uh, the sand, and that's the characteristic of frac sand that is, that is of high value to the oil and gas drilling uh, companies. It allows the oil and gas to flow through the sand after it's been pumped down into the well. Customers, uh, we supply sand to uh, service companies such as Halliburton, Schlumberger, these are the drilling companies. We also supply sand directly to the operators, the oil companies, ExxonMobil, uh, El Paso, Texaco. This is a, a picture cross-section of, of geology, oil-bearing uh, geology. And this is gas, um, gas-bearing rocks, shales, uh, dolomites. You see there's little, little pockets within the geology um, that don't transfer uh, gas to each other. They're essentially locked in the geology. What the frac sand does is when it's pumped down into the well, it's, it fractures the rock, and then the uh, gas can communicate uh, back up the well. So this is a high pressure, uh, sand is pumped down into the well and it's fracturing the geology and propagating out. This is a, a equipment layout for a frac site. Uh, lots of pumps, lots of sand, lots of, lots of water uh, pumping down, pumping sand down into the well. Talking about uh, natural resources, uh, natural resources essentially uh, mining in general, um, there's the, the saying if it can't be grown uh, it has to be mined. U.S. raw uh, material demand um, is, is climbing um, readily. Uh, you can see crushed stone, sand, and gravel uh, in the uh, top graph. Uh, that's construction. That's, that's pretty much development. Uh, roads, buildings. And then you can see the industrial minerals uh, section of that uh, is growing as well. So demand for all raw materials um, are going up. And the primary primary source of the raw raw material production is the mining industry. This is a cross section uh, called the the mineral baby, but this kind of gives you an idea um, for a lifetime how much and of what minerals uh, you will consume uh, throughout your life. It goes through the copper, salts, clays, zinc, coal, lead, silica, iron ore, cement. So this kind of gives you an idea that you know we are consuming uh, natural resources, we are consuming uh, raw materials. A little bit about uh, Fairmont Minerals, a uh, company I work for. You'll see uh, number six in Wisconsin represents three operations. Uh, our other mining operations were primarily a Midwest mining company. 
Uh, we frac, frac sand, fracturing sand is just one of our many markets. Uh, our other mines supply uh, several different products uh, to several different uh, customers. I'll, I'll show you a market uh, supply here in a minute. This is where we uh, ship our sands to, uh, primarily by rail. Market um, fracturing sand is, is one of many markets within our within the industrial sand uh, industry itself. Uh, commercial glass is a huge part of our business as well. Uh, right now, Minami uh, supplies glass sand into uh, Cardinal Glass. Metal castings, foundry, anything that is made of steel has, has a part to it. Uh, uses sand as the uh, um, as as the shape forming uh, form for the foundry. Water filtration, municipal water wells, clean cleaning water. Um, with our with our sands out in Ohio, um, they're not round; they're more angular, so they trap uh, particles uh, in water filtration systems. It's a huge market force uh, in Ohio. And then, of course, uh, fracturing sands, oil, and natural gas. So, getting to the um, the core of my uh, presentation right now, uh, the economic and social benefits. But you know, before before I get into this, I'll I'll briefly explain. Um, any mining operation before uh, they begin operations has to go through uh, quite a bit of a, a phase for obtaining, being able to obtain a permit. There's many uh, many concerns, questions, <laughs> issues coming from coming from a community. Economic and social benefits are just one of many. Uh, just to name a few, the, the top of the list, uh, safety and health, uh, our employees and also our communities is a, is a, is a question uh, at the top of the list as well as surface water, groundwater, uh, blasting, number of trucks, traffic, road conditions, uh, noise, reclamation, uh, stormwater. Uh, these, are the, these are the top issues and concerns that we hear at our meetings when we're uh, operating mine in a community, uh, whether we're just applying for a permit or it's an ongoing process. Uh, community relations as far as uh, community advisory uh, committees are at all of our plants and, and we're very active in communication with, with our communities and these, these issues do come up and they do come up regularly. Um, we answer uh, questions through a technical process and we have technical experts that assist us with uh, several of these uh, questions and concerns. I'll focus in on the economic and social benefit. Uh, top of the list, jobs. Uh, the average mining operation in Wisconsin uh, is typically about 30 employees. Uh, that holds true for the three operations that I manage as well. They have different numbers of employees at each site, but if you take the average over the three, the average is about 30 to 31 uh, people at each, each facility. Uh, the average uh, wages, benefits, uh, comes out to be uh, $58,000 per year. So that gives you an idea on the average compensation for uh, the employees uh, within Wisconsin Industrial Sand. Uh, the economic benefit, um, it's over, over $5 million uh, per year. And what I did not include in there is the indirect impact, which is the bottom bullet. But what is in that $5 million is the direct impact, which is the compensation provided to uh, the employees who work at the uh, mining and processing facility. Induced impact, which is uh, changes uh, due to employee spending. Uh, the, we make money and then we spend money in the uh, community. Uh, and that's the, that's the uh, induced impact. Um, employment multiplier. Not only do we hire and have people working at our facilities, but there's other jobs created uh, because of the operation. Uh, you can go from the uh, truck drivers. Uh, we do not run the trucks ourselves. We contract that out. Uh, we could have anywhere between five and 12 full-time drivers at each one of our facilities. Uh, it also boils down to you know, the UPS driver that delivers the mail, uh, the fuel truck driver that delivers fuel, uh, maintenance personnel, service personnel that come on, come on site and help us maintain our equipment. And then indirect impact, which is changes uh, due to goods and services used by, uh, used by our operation, the fuel that we buy, um, the electricity, the natural gas uh, that we buy. The other benefit, um, community involvement, volunteerism. 
Uh, our company does quite a bit of quite a bit of work within our communities, and we actually require employees to volunteer a minimum of 20 hours uh, per year, and that's paid volunteer work. Uh, we also focus in uh, quite a bit on wildlife habitat. I'll cruise through this because I know I'm running out of time. These are some of our volunteer projects, Habitat for Humanity. Uh, back in 2008, our entire company uh, shut down and descended upon uh, Wakanda Park here in, in Menominee. Uh, we took a full day. We installed uh, playground equipment. We did uh, quite a bit of work as far as clearing out uh, invasive species. Uh, eight hours, everybody put in a full day of work in, in the park, and, and we made quite a, quite a difference there. Uh, trout streams. Uh, we do quite a bit of projects uh, before and after uh, Pine Creek. This is down in Maiden Rock, and this is what it looks like today. Uh, wildlife habitat certification. These are our, uh, our bats. We have uh, over 50,000 bats in each one of our underground mines. We have an underground mine in Maiden Rock and one in Bay City. We work closely with the DNR on uh, managing that uh, habitat. And then we, we take a quite a bit of pride as far as uh, wildlife at work, and we, we uh, track species on, on site, and we make sure that there's natural habitat to uh, promote species. Lots of uh, tours, school tours, uh, educational tours. We have uh, a, lot of, a lot of work out in the field, planting trees, working with uh, communities and groups to uh, essentially make sure that they have uh, uh, great funding for, for great causes. And open houses, we offer tours, open houses at our facility as well. Uh, we have lots of programs uh, according to sustainable development. Sustainable development, uh, we track our greenhouse gases, our electrical, our diesel use. Uh, we also have several goals. Uh, recycling is, is just uh, one of them. Our goal as a company right now uh, in the year 2013 is to become a zero waste uh, facility at all of our operations within Fairmont Mills. Everything will be recycled. <coughs> Energy efficiencies, we focus in on uh, using the best available technologies for energy efficiencies. We just installed uh, quite a few solar arrays at our Menominee facility. Uh, we also uh, became the first LEED certified building within Dunn County, something that we are very proud of. Uh, energy efficiency uh, building, first green building. That pretty much uh, wraps it up. Um, our motto is uh, do good, do well. Uh, we live by it every day. Uh, just to kind of give you guys a, a brief overview on our operations, this is our plan in Menominee, a close-up shot, uh, sand processing facility, as well as our terminals. Uh, we have a rail terminal in Wheeler, Wisconsin, uh, one on the Union Pacific uh, off the Cardinal Glass facility. This is a, a, a transloader that we use, uh, drive over tail, the trucks come in and, and load rail cars uh, with the conveyor. <coughs> So that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Our next guest speakers came together from UW Eau Claire. There are three of them. They are Dr. Crispin Pierce, who is Associate Professor and Program Director of the Public Health Program at UW Eau Claire. Mr. James Fay is a senior environmental public health major. Based on research that they have been doing, they will discuss particulate health risks from sand mining and processing. And today also, we are um, pleased to have Mr. Greg Nelson, also a senior in environmental public health from UW Eau Claire. Thank you, Linda. It's really a pleasure to be here, and particularly as a professor where I see young students like this learning about important issues to the public, doing research that I think will be very valuable to the public. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the research we're doing and principally focused on some of the airborne health effects that are associated with generation of particulates and crystalline silica as a result of sand mining and processing. I do have handouts. We brought just 40, if you'd like, a kind of a summary of our talk. You're welcome to pick up a handout after the talk. They'll be right up here. Okay, gentlemen, let's roll. <laughs> 
So what is fracking? Uh, Mr. Budinger talked briefly about what this process is, and the demand for sand in the upper Midwest is driven by this fracking process through which oil and gas are extracted from the ground in places like the Marcellus Shale <coughs> in the northeast portion of the United States. So it is taking sand and actively uh, mixing it with water and as well as some, actually, some proprietary components injected thousands of meters down and now thousands of meters horizontally to open fractures in uh, shale formations to pull out that oil and gas. And here's a, a kind of a picture here, a little bit of a cartoon. Um, so again, as we saw with Mr. Budinger's presentation, there is a, a, a frack, oh, oh, what would the term be, the group of pumps? Uh, the, the fracturing process? Yes. So there's a whole area with a group of pumper trucks that's actually mm -hmm. actively pumping this liquid, this fluid, which includes, again, sand, water, and some other components into the soil down thousands of meters and then horizontally to open up those fissures again to collect oil and gas reserves. So some of the health risks we look at from an environmental health point of view would be waterborne pollutants that can be ingested, our focus, which is airborne pollutants that can be inhaled, but certainly noise pollution that can be heard, light pollution, wetland loss, truck traffic, and greenhouse gas generation that increases climate change. So from environmental health point of view, all of these are on our radar. We're able to focus in on some of the particulates, the airborne exposure that we may be concerned about. There are many aspects to a health risk assessment. We have to include things like the type and rates of chemicals that are being emitted to the air, water, and soil, the degree of contact between the chemicals and the public, and that the way that these chemicals cause short-term and long-term damage for people. So this would be true if we're worried about nitrates in drinking water, particulates from a sand mine, uh, contaminants of food, E. coli, contamination of spinach, for example. All of these are chemical e exposures we're concerned about. We look at particulate matter, and we're talking about increased respiratory symptoms such as irritation of the airways, coughing or difficulty breathing, decreased lung function, aggravated asthma, development of chronic bronchitis, irregular heartbeat, non-fatal attacks, and premature death in people with heart or lung disease. So the idea is any kind of small particulates, when they get deep into the lung, whether it's we're having a temperature inversion, whether we're having um, a forest fire, whether we're having a lot of people using their outdoor wood burners, all these generate little particles that can get into the lungs and make it more difficult to breathe. And size is very important. Again, Mr. Budinger had a really nice picture of the kind of size and shape of the particles, the sand grains that fracturing companies are interested in. They tend to be in the coarse sand or medium sand size range. For us, we're most interested in the very, very small particles, which are that tiny little thing, you see where it says clay, just to the left of clay, if you can see that, these PM 2.5, or 2.5 microns or smaller particles. Those are the ones that get into the deep lung that we're most concerned about. James, do you want to talk a little bit about crystalline silica? So the main chemical of concern um, with frac sand mining and processing is the generation of particulate matter, um, specifically crystalline silica. It is um, a known human carcinogen. If inhaled, it will scar the lungs. And like Dr. Pierce uh, touched upon, it can um, aggravate the lung tissue and uh, scar the actual uh, alveolar cells of your lung. And this can eventually uh, lead to cancer. So, uh, so silicosis is a uh, fibrosis of the lungs. It's the, the scarring of the lungs. That's what, that's what happens when you inhale uh, small uh, crystalline silica particles. And it's a progressive, uh, progressive uh, disease and can lead to disability and even death. And about 200 people in the U.S. will die this year due to workplace exposure to silica. This is uh, just a map showing um, where prevalence of silicosis is at its highest. The darker shaded states are uh, where silicosis is most prevalent, Wisconsin being one of those. 
Uh, and the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health reported 75 deaths in Wisconsin between 1996 and 2005 from silicosis, primarily among uh, workers in manufacturing, construction, and mining. And between 8 and 18 people are expected to die in Wisconsin from silicosis in 2011. Uh, another major worry um, it, when uh, crystalline silica is inhaled is that uh, lung cancer can develop because, like I said before, crystalline silica is a human carcinogen, and uh, the, the regulatory agencies you see on the screen all uh, confirm that crystalline silica is a carcinogen when inhaled. Uh, some other... Uh, some other diseases that may be affected by inhalation of crystalline silica um, could have a greater uh, prevalence of tuberculosis. Uh, silico silicosis increases this risk. And uh, autoimmune and chronic kidney disease. Um, some studies show excess numbers of cases of scleroderma, connective tissue disorders, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, like I said, chronic kidney diseases, and end-stage kidney disease. And also, uh, non-malignant respiratory diseases um, also can be, uh, their, their risk can be increased. So, the mining and processing activities generate particulate matter through mining, transporting, and processing of the sand, and also transporting the waste sand. And uh, crystalline silica is the main component of sand. Sand deposits in Wisconsin have high levels of crystalline silica. Um, also, as Mr. Mr. Budinger explained, the, uh, the spherical shape and strength of the sand makes it attractive for um, use in hydraulic fracturing. And uh, silica is a natural component of solar uh, soils. Excuse me. Um, however, the, the weathered silica, the, uh, the kind you would find in agricultural soils, just kind of sand that you find on the beach, is much less dangerous than. Uh, freshly fractured silica, uh, silica that's been processed because there are more uh, free electrons that are uh, very reactive, they're called free radicals that can damage uh, lung tissue. And here is uh, kind of just a picture of a uh, um, pile of sand and you can you can see the the dust blowing off there so that's that's our the major concern and uh, the focus of our research. So, as of right now, uh, there are five states regulating crystalline silica exposure. Um, California has a uh, three microgram per cubic meter standard to protect the public from silicosis. And uh, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources uh, admits that crystalline silica is a human carcinogen but currently is not regulate, reg, regulating it as a uh, hazardous air pollutant. So uh, these young men and a couple other excellent students at UW-Eau Claire, you can tell I'm a little bit proud of my students, um, have done work over the last three years looking at some of these health risks. We work both in the laboratory and now in the field to determine what kinds of particulate and silica exposures are present. We went out, we've actually, uh, we did ask EOG permission, but they denied us. They felt that it was a safety risk to have us on site. Uh, we contacted landowners and actually set up some sampling points. We took GPS data, humidity, temperature, wind speed, and particulate concentrations, upwind and downwind of the Chippewa Falls EOG plant. So here's a picture of the facility. I think this is still in development. It started operation as of, I understand, November 1st. So we went before plant operation at the end of July, and then we went last weekend as well to try to get baseline levels as well as operational levels of what might be in the air. So uh, Greg is going to demonstrate a little bit of this equipment that we use to do the sampling. The first is an industrial sampler that we got from Wisconsin State Lab of Hygiene. And this is a sampler typically used in the workplace to assess exposure to small particulates. The air comes in through here spins around, we get the smallest particulates, the breathable or respirable particulates, particulates on this filter, and then it's analyzed for the dust and the silica it picks up. The second uh, device we've used here is this dust track device, and this is going to measure the mass of particulates in the air. I have a 
picture of the dust track. And so what we did is we brought a little bit of the Jordan sand that we talked about earlier. And I think the important thing is to take a look at the numbers for both base, baseline number for particulates and then what happens when we generate a little bit of sand. So this was taken and we took samples all around upwind and downwind of the particular facility. So as you can see, it's a little difficult to see. We're at about nine microgram per cubic meter. So gentlemen, if you will just gently agitate that uh, Jordan sandstone. And so again, we have a sampler on this device that looks at the particle sizes that get down into the deep lung, the PM 2.5. Those are the sample concentrations we're concerned about. So we start at nine, we're up to about 60 now, 65. We start to get concerned when we get regular levels above about 15 chronic. So this is a very short exposure. We don't expect this to be an accurate exposure for the whole time. We'd like to measure for days, weeks, or months to see if the particulates up. But even though you cannot see any of the small particles, we're getting a reading on this um, dust rack machine. The third machine we used was a Dylos particulate monitor. I know folks, part of concerned shipwater citizens, have a network of about eight of these monitors. Uh, they kindly lend us one so we can calibrate it and see how it does compared to our other devices. So the, the number on the left is a small particulates, the number on the right large. We actually subtract the two to get some idea of the particulates in the air. So Greg, if you'll do, give a little bit of um, shaking near the input. So you can see we're starting at about 725 and, and pretty quickly we're up in the 1,000, 1,300 range. So even though we're not generating dust clouds, we're certainly measuring the very small particulates that we're most concerned about. So we have some initial data. Uh, we do want to call these preliminary data. We're waiting for confirmation from the State Lab of Hygiene from some of their analysis as well. These are the baseline sample numbers that we took July 30th and 31st. Uh, the upper plot represents the downwind sample and the, the lower blue plot represents the upwind sample. So in this very short snapshot, as we call it, of eight hours, we saw more dust downwind than upwind. And this is before the plant opened. So these materials could be as a part of construction of the facility, for example. We took samples just over the last weekend, and we found some pretty high numbers. The orange levels represent EPA standards. And this is with the Dylos here machine. Uh, we're still interpreting these numbers, waiting for confirmation from the state lab. But the higher number, numbers may re actually represent more particulates now the plant is operating, but it also could represent increased humidity at night. We're double checking that not right now, but we are seeing some numbers that say, let's look into this a little bit further. And even after we have the, 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 the red plot as it comes down, we're still above an EPA standard that we would be concerned about. And as we com compare the pre opening of the plant, the baseline, which would be on the left, the red and blue, to the post-opening, the green and blue, we do see a difference that we're interested in pursuing. So it looks like we're seeing greater numbers of particulates after the plant is operation. But again, these are initial data, preliminary data. And if we look at the concentrations, upwind and downwind, we see that it, it looks like afterwards we had higher particulate concentrations. Uh, Something we don't fully understand is why on the first day we had greater levels downwind, on the second day we had greater levels upwind. So we're still investigating why that is. So in conclusion, we found general agreement between our three methods of testing, both with the dust track machine, with the Dylos machine, and with our state lab of hygiene samples. Plant operation levels were about three times the baseline levels of PM 2.5. Again, we're looking to see if moisture might have affected that. Uh, baseline downwind and operation up and downwind PM levels look to be above EPA standards. That raises some concern for us. And we, we can't at this point understand why we had different levels, sometimes upwind higher and sometimes downwind was higher. And finally, in terms of the recommendations, I know a lot of folks in the communities around here are looking for ways to protect the citizens, protect folks. Uh, we've tried to reach out to mining companies and certainly city and town boards to find some common ground. Our recommendations at this point is to adopt a standard that James mentioned earlier of three microgram per cubic meter for respirable silica, to require air monitoring at sand mines and processing plants, and to compare the air monitoring levels to the, to the silica levels and the EPA PM10 and PM2.5 particulate standards to determine health risks.
Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Mr. Tom Wolitz. He's an engineer and has been employed by the DNR for 36 years, working in almost all of their environmental regulatory programs. Presently, he is Senior Manager and Projects Coordinator in the Water Division, and he is the contact person for frac sand issues. Are there any empty seats? We've got some people sitting or standing in the back. If, if you have an empty seat next to you, would you raise your hand? Thank you very much. Um, one of the disadvantages of talking after all these guys, they've covered some of the stuff I want to cover, so uh, I'm going to kind of wing it on some of the slides, go a little bit faster on things that I think you've already been showing and are aware of. So, <coughs> sand mining in Wisconsin is not new. We've been mining sand and non-metallic minerals in Wisconsin for over 100 years for a variety of uses. And all sand is silica sand. It's made of silicon dioxide, so it'll be big particles, small particles. It's all silicon dioxide. We monitor for foundry sand, glass sand, water filtration, construction, sandblasting, sandbox and playground sand, and road sand. And I don't say sandbox sand lightly to make fun of it or to minimize it. We do. Uh, there are mines in Wisconsin that make sand for play school. You go to Menards, you can buy sand in bags. It's been mined in Wisconsin. It's a widespread activity in Wisconsin. We have a variety of geological environments provided for diverse industries. Currently, an estimated 2,500 mines in the state of Wisconsin. And I do want to I want to make a clarification. Are these, we have a lot of mines in Wisconsin. Had a lot of them before even frac became popular, and a lot of them were big. You can drive across at the Chippewa River and look off to the right. You can see the big A1 pit there. We've got a sand processing plant that sat right below our office for 35 years, Red Flint. They, they dry sand, they process sand, they do filter sand. These new mines, for generally speaking, and I don't have any statistics, but they are much, much larger than the average mines we've got in Wisconsin, these 2,500. They are very efficient at getting mineral out of the ground. They do it quicker and faster. And, you know, it's not a matter of a dozen dump trucks a day. We're talking unit trains, which is 100 cars. So these are... These are big operations. These guys are these guys are in business to remove mineral. Production value on non-metallic minerals in Wisconsin was big. In 2007, it's 540 million dollars. We were the number one producer of Dimension Stone, and in 2007, we were the number three in industrial sand. And I'm guessing we're number one right now. Rich covered this. I guess the only thing I have to add, what makes our sand really attractive here is that it's usually close to the surface and easy to mine. This is kind of an interesting side. I won't talk too much about the geology, but this sand is like 500 million years old. Wisconsin, 500 million years ago, was floating around at the equator, and you know, a lot of Wisconsin was underwater. The sand was formed as the seas pushed back and forth on the sand and rounded it and then finally dropped it down and eventually Wisconsin got up to be where we're at now. You can see in the red, that's where the good frac sand is in the United States and we're, we're right in the epicenter. That's Wisconsin and Minnesota. You can skip that one. Again, the, the good frac sand down on the left, uh, sand with a lot of conglomerate and junk in it and on the top is some real angular sand. Pretty popular in Wisconsin. A lot of the counties have, have mines in it. Even Burnett County has a has a kind of a remnant geological uh, formation up there that they're mining frac sand out of. If you drive down I-94 and you get around Oakdale, you can look off to the east and you can see some of the cranberry uh, cran sand operations there. Nice, beautiful white sand, real close to the surface, alluvial sand. We talked about the horizontal drilling, so I don't think I'll cover that. Skip that. You can skip that. New York, has, New York has a moratorium on fracking of 
wells there. You saw this picture, but you can skip that. It's called propent, you know, and again, it hold, that's a term you're gonna hear for the sand because it holds the crevices open. You can see where a lot of the gas is. A lot of our gas is, or a lot of our frac sand is going out to the Bakken in the Williston, North Dakota area, Montana border up there by Saskatchewan. Kind of a typical mining process. You remove sand, remove the overburden on the sand, uh, possibly blast it in some cases. Uh, you do go through a rough screening. You wash the sand to remove the fines. The sand goes to a drying or stockpile for further screening and then possible resin coating and then transport. And rail is a big part of this industry. Here's the DNR permits and regulations. We issue air management permits for all mines and processing facilities. The WPDS general non-metallic stormwater permit for all mines and processing facilities. High capacity well permit and dewatering permit for withdrawals in excess of 70 gallons per minute in aggregate. The same wetlands and shoreland zoning that apply everywhere for anyone. And we'll also do an endangered and threatened species uh, review of the sites and an archeological review for archeological resources on the sites. And if there is any, we'll work with the historical society. <laughs> for the air permits, we require an applicant to quantify all air emission sources at the facility. We'll review the application to determine if the ambient air quality standards will be met. The air permit will contain operational and testing requirements to assure compliance with the permit. Ambient particulate monitors will be required unless a waiver is granted. The fugitive dust plan is required by the air permit. And the fugitive dust plan we're learning now from what we've been seeing is really a critical portion that we're going to really pay attention to because uh, we have been seeing pictures like the one you saw with sand blowing off the piles. Uh, road issues, other issues with fugitive dust. And fugitive dust is dust that comes not out of a stack, not out of a dryer stack or a, you know, a processing point, but it comes not from a stack. A lot of it from, from the pile dust. WPDS general non-metallic stormwater permit regulates discharge of stormwaters and process wastewaters to the groundwaters or surface waters of the state. Wastewaters include processed wash waters, non-contact cooling waters, vehicle wash waters, and mine dewatering. And again, we've learned that uh, they have to pay attention. These big mines who want to get up quick and running really have to pay attention to good stormwater control plans because we've seen several uh, blowouts of dikes and uh, ponds that weren't constructed properly or stormwater structures that weren't designed to uh, to hold the, the water that, that came into the mine through the rain events. Let's see, high capacity well dewatering permits required again when they're over 70 gallons a minute. Uh, our hydrogeologist will model and look at the analysis of the withdrawal impacts on springs, trout streams, outstanding and exceptional resource waters, and public water supplies. We don't look at, we don't have the authority to regulate impacts of these high capacity wells on residential wells. But we are looking at them when we get an application and we're kind of using a rule of thumb, take the capacity of the well, say if it's a thousand gallons per minute, divide by two, get a number 500, and we're telling the mines that, you know, if you're within 500 feet with this thousand gallon per minute well of a residential well, you have the, the ability to impact it and drop their water level and it would be nice if you would move it over here. And, and they have been fairly cooperative, although if we got push came to shove, I don't think we'd have a legal basis to stand on them to, to do that. Again, the same wetland and shoreland zoning that applies to everyone. Ponds within 500 feet are connected to navigable waterway. And when you deal with navigable waterways, there's also joint jurisdiction with the Corps of Engineers. Grading within 300 feet of a navigable water, dredging, construction of culverts or bridges, on navigable waterways, 75 foot setback from the ordinary high water mark. And if they want to fill a wetland, um, it's, it's quite a process to go through. You need to show that there were no, there were no alternatives to, for, for you not to fill that wetland. If, you, if there was another way you could have routed your road or your <coughs> infrastructure to get around it, we expect them to do that. We wouldn't grant the permit. Did you find navigable water? 
Navigable water by Wisconsin law, and it's over 100 years old, is any stream that has the ability to float a canoe one time a year. So we have dry runs in Wisconsin on real flashy terrain that can float a canoe and are, they're considered navigable. It's a very old law. And we'll work with the Fish and Wildlife Service to, uh, to look at endangered and threatened species. Uh, we're, again, we're cooperative, cooperatively with the Archaeological Survey to uh, look at archaeological sites. Uh, we'll also look at the, you know, the infrastructure, the rail spurs, uh, pipelines, gas lines that go in. They're also included, the, the disturbance uh, on them and it will be included. The one interesting thing we've kind of run into is the Carner Blue Butterfly is a federally endangered species. It likes lupin, it's a flower, it tends to grow in sandy areas and that's, uh, that's where they want to mine and so that's been an issue in some of the, some of the sand mines locating in the, in the Monroe, Juneau County area, southern part of the state. And the reclamation program. This is a program that actually, although it has an NR prefix to it, it's administered by the county uh, in Dunn County, Amanda uh, works for the Soil Conservation Service here. Does a great job on it, and uh, it makes sure that they, you know, that they have a plan to reclaim the mine into something useful when when they've mined it all out and they've left. And we do provide technical oversight and uh, review of the programs. You probably probably skip this talks about reclamation. Have to, they have to provide financial assurance so in case somebody does go, you know, defaults on, on the property, they don't, uh, there's money left in a fund so that the county can come back in and fix it up. I think that might be a Badger site down in southern part of the state that's a reclaimed site. A lot of these sites are reclaimed as prairies or hunting land. Uh, when they do come in to, to begin a mine, they'll strip off, the, a good company will strip off the topsoil and stockpile that so that they can use it at a later date. And some of the areas can be uh, farmed again. Next slide. Operating issues, blasting is regulated by the Department of Commerce. Uh, traffic operating schedule, road maintenance, etc. best handled and a conditional use permit. I think Ron's going to talk a little bit about that, about his, uh, he was instrumental in the agreement with the town of Howard with EOG. And again, reclamation is regulated by NR 135. Okay, next slide. MSHA is the OSHA for uh, mine safety uh, at all uh, mining facilities, and they, they do monitoring to make sure that the uh, silicosis and, and the uh, pre-silica levels at the mines are safe. Advantages, local, oh, let's see. Local jobs and economic growth, like Rich talked about. Uh, energy independence. We've had a pretty good history with industrial sand mining. We have had very few problems in 100 years. And when compared to some of the other types of mining, sand mining has a minimal environmental impact and sand mines can be reclaimed successfully and there's no acid mine drainage associated with sand mines. Here's some of the problems. Groundwater usage, potential for contamination, air quality, truck traffic, blasting, noise levels, and whether they do a good job of reclamation, subsequent land use. Here's one of the Kind of the bad examples, a mine up in Chippewa, one of the retaining ponds blew out. That's uh, water from the mine, a combination of storm water as well as process water from the washing that uh, went into Trout Creek, which is a trout stream. That's not what we like to see. Next, and there's the same one of the blowing sand. Again, a very poor fugitive dust plant at that site. And they're gonna, we are working with them to, so that, uh, to prevent this from happening. Same one as you saw before. Some of, the, some of those, I've been to sand mines, and even though it looks like a lot of sand is going on, sand piles, if you watch them, they tend to kind of roll, uh, and sand actually doesn't blow off site, but you're seeing a rolling of sand. Now, that, that's not just rolling of sand there. That's, that's a problem. Next slide. 
I think this is going to continue as long as uh, there's a demand for frac sand, and they use a lot of sand in these sand, uh, the fracking operations, 4,000 to a million tons per well. And it's under high, the other thing is it's under very high pressure. It's anywhere from 5,000 to 15,000 pounds is what they, what they pump it down under. So it kind of took us by surprise. I don't think anybody anticipated this boom. Many counties were overwhelmed by the mining applications and the scale of mining has presented problems we haven't dealt with before. So they're big and there are a lot of them and they keep coming in. It's just, it's surprising. We get applications almost on a daily basis or a weekly basis for sure. There's my content. Okay, our last speaker is Dr. Ron Koshashek, a retired ethics professor from UW Eau Claire. He has an extensive interest and achievement in the area of natural resources. He helped to negotiate the sand mine contract for the town of Howard, where he is a resident. Hello. Yeah. Well, what uh, Linda asked me to be on this panel, um, I asked, she asked me what I wanted to talk about, and I said, well, I'll just wait till everybody else talks, and then I'll talk about what's left over. <laughs> so I've left myself a huge open agenda here, but it appears to me that uh, what has not been talked about is what citizens, uh, who, I mean, we've heard the upsides, we've heard the, the benefits, and, and we've heard some of the risks. Um, what can citizens do to try to address some of these problems at the local level? All levels of government have been unprepared for this and remain unprepared for it, although they're learning as fast as they can. So let's say that uh, by now you have probably or have been faced with an application for a, a frac sand mine or processing plant. Um, what can you as citizens do? Well, I've uh, been involved in two towns assisting them in preparing to deal with these issues. One is my hometown of Howard, and the other was a uh, citizens, uh, citizens group in Prairie Farm. Both of these towns have done very well and are doing very well in addressing the problems faced by their citizens. And what I'm impressed with is the, uh, you know, in all these towns it's controversy and conflict and family pitted against family, and it's kind of an ugly social setting. Um, but uh, if you are concerned and want your town to act, you need to organize um, your, into a group, because a solitary voice or sitting on the john in the morning, wringing your hands and whining about the world is not going to help you at all. So you need to get together, and Howard, when I first first meeting I went to in Howard, there was a group already organized of younger people in the town concerned about their children and their families. And the Howard mine is deposited right in the middle of 13 homes. I mean, it's a quasi-residential district. And so there was considerable concern about impact on neighbors and as who live you know, up to 300 feet uh, away from the edge of the property on which the mine site is located. Um, but in the end, you have to work with your town board. Uh, the town board is, is probably our, our finest example of a truly democratic institution. And uh, I certainly have in my years as a professor, I also served on the public intervener, in the public intervener office in the Department of Justice that was created in, in, to oversee state agencies to make sure they comply with environmental law. And the other thing we did is we represented townships and citizen groups who thought there should be things like uh, a pesticide law, a groundwater protection law, mining law, uh, 
I've been part of drafting and developing every environment, significant environmental law in the state of Wisconsin between 1975 and 1995 when the office was closed. So I'm familiar with this sort of territory, and uh, that's what I want to talk to you, to you about. The first thing that you need to do if you are, I mean, town boards are not experienced with this. They've been, they've built the infrastructure for the agricultural industry over the years, and they have, uh, and, the, and their primary job has always been filling potholes and, and, and resurfacing roads. But if it, if it's not a pothole that's a problem, they don't quite know how to deal with it. I don't say that disparagingly. I'm simply saying their experience does not prepare them for that. So there's a lot of education that needs to go on, and they're busy, they're working. Most of them are farmers themselves or have jobs and elsewhere. And uh, it is uh, the citizens that have to take it upon themselves to, to educate uh, about these issues. So you can adopt a moratorium by, by simple town resolution. You don't need public hearings and or, as you do with ordinances and so forth. You can adopt a moratorium which essentially gives you oh, up to four to six months uh, to get your act together to address these things. Um, the next thing you have to figure out is what are your town powers? Are you a zone town? How many here are zoned, in, live in a town that's zoned? How many are in an unzoned town? Well, see, there we go. Uh, in, in Wisconsin, there's around 727 zone towns with county zoning, about 242 or so that have their own town zoning, and 250 some that are unzoned at all. Uh, and, and those towns are, most of them are located in west central Wisconsin, in the western, which is in northern, northwestern Wisconsin. So let's say that you're a zone town. You're pretty well off. You have some local control. This is what you can now. To, you, you need to, if you if you are zoned, you're either under town zoning or county zoning. Most of you here are under county. Is there anyone here whose town has their own zoning power? I didn't think so. Everybody here, if they're zoned, is under under county zoning. Here's what you can do if you're under county zoning. A zone town can determine where frac sand mines are located. You can determine the location. You can prohibit them in some zones, for example, where there is uh, sensitive water waters or public recreational areas that might be affected or, um, or where there's prime farmland. But in order to do that, you need a comprehensive plan that sort of everyone has agreed on in the town to do that. So, for any zone town, your comprehensive plan is absolutely critical for you. And if you haven't foreseen and dealt with this whole the issues associated with with uh, frac sand mining, then you need to look at your comprehensive plan and assist your town or your plan commission chairman or whatnot to uh, to amend that comp plan to enable you to properly address uh, that issue. In some areas, uh, as I said, you can prohibit mining. Sometimes you can also, if you're a zone town, um, especially if you have town zoning, uh, you can determine the total amount of acreage, which at any given time can be devoted to frac sand mining. You can say, well, okay, 3% of this town total acreage can be, but not anymore until a mine is reclaimed and closed and <coughs> so on and so forth. You can't prohibit it, though, entirely. Um, if you're a zone town, you can place, uh, you can you can control traffic routes. Trucking is a real issue. In, in Howard, for example, as we move from from uh, the mine, see, they don't we don't have a processing plant in Howard on the mine site. We the processing plant is in Chippewa Falls, and it's transported by trucking from from the, the site mine site to the plant in, in Chippewa Falls. That's about 15 miles. Uh, uh, they, they do not go on town roads at all. But if they did on town roads, which fall under the jurisdiction of the town, uh, such as if there were a processing plant somewhere and they were hauling from another site which required the use of a town road, uh, then onto a county road and state road or whatever, um, you can determine where that traffic flow is going to be so you channel it away from sections of road 
that are densely uh, populated with uh, residential homes. I'll locate it very close to it. You can do that.